All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the latest installment of uh, our autism awareness programming. Uh, my name is Dan. I am the Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford Playhouse, and I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in this evening. Uh, before we introduce um, our moderator and she introduces the rest of our panel, uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, please feel free at any point during the conversation to ask a question. You can find the Q&A button to do so at the bottom of your screen on your laptops or PCs. Uh, it's at the top of your screen if you're on your phone or on your iPad. Um, the Bedford Playhouse is uh, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so we rely on the support of the community uh, for our many of our endeavors. So we uh, humbly ask that if you are so inclined, if you enjoy tonight's conversation and you'd like to see us do more programming like this, please take a minute to visit our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org and consider making a donation. Um, any amount uh, is useful and appreciated. And uh, we're very, very grateful for all the support that we get. Uh, with that being said, and without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Cassandra Newsom, who is going to tell you a little bit about herself and then introduce the rest of our panel. Hey, Cassandra. Hi, thank you for having me tonight. I'm excited um, about this talk and we have an excellent group of panelists who are going to be very informative. Um, I am Dr. Cassandra Newsom. I am a licensed clinical psychologist at the University of Alabama um, at Birmingham and specialize in um, the diagnosis of autism and autism research. Um, also joining us tonight are Dr. Michelle Gorenstein from Mount Sinai, um, Dr. Catherine Ballone from the University of Texas at Southwestern and Dr. Um, Peter Faustino, um, who is a National Association um, School Psychologist. And they're going to each take just a second and tell you a little bit about themselves and their background, which might help you guys um, know what types of questions you want to ask um, as the panel starts. Um, Michelle? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Michelle Gorenstein. I am a clinical psychologist at the Seaver Autism Center, which is located at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. Um, and we are mainly a research center. So most of what we do is in the context of research to understand kind of genetic causes of autism, um, to better understand how to study autism and what are kind of um, best outcome measures, um, as well as clinical trials related to autism. My job there is pretty unique in that I'm not directly involved in research. So I am the director of community outreach and I actually spend most of my time in the community. Um, so I receive funding through UGA Federation of New York and I work with community centers across the tri-state area um, to help community centers better serve children, teens and adults on the autism spectrum. I do a lot of parent training um, and then I have a faculty practice where I see teens and young adults on the spectrum who have comorbid anxiety and depression. Thank you. And um, Katie? Hi. Um, so Katie Pallone, I'm a psychologist and board certified behavior analyst. And um, as Cassandra mentioned, I work at UT Southwestern Medical Center and Children's Health. Um, in the Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities. So I am a therapist in what I do every day. Um, I work with children and adolescents and families um, impacted by autism or other developmental disabilities. Um, oftentimes families are coming to see me when they have a child who has um, pretty significant emotional and behavioral challenges associated with their autism diagnosis. So. That's um, what I get to do every day, and I, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much. And Peter. Yeah, thank you. I'm also really excited to be here. I, I, I find that April being Autism Awareness Month, we get to have these conversations, you know, so frequently. And because it's such a passion for, I think, the panelists, right? It's uh, it, it's just a great opportunity. So um, I I'm local. I I was working in the Bedford school system for about um, 16 years. I'm a school psychologist as well as a licensed psychologist. Um, I'm currently working at Scarsdale High School, but maintain a private practice 
and um, just tend to just get involved in a lot of different things. So I'm the past president of the New York Association of School Psychologists. I'm currently a board of directors member at the National Association of School Psychologists. Um, Westchester County has an association for psychologists and I'm the current president of that organization. Um, and then related to autism, not only in the school systems where I've always worked, have I um, been able to, you know, help children and families um, diagnosed with autism, but um, many years ago got connected to some wonderful organizations and charities like Autism Speaks or the Autism Science Foundation and just um, have, you know, benefited from the, the interactions and the collaborations with, the, with those organizations, so. Great, thank you. Um, so I thought I would just start um, by asking some general questions and, and any of you are welcome to, to chime in. So how common are anxiety and depression and other mood problems in people with autism? And do you think there's a problem with them being underdiagnosed? Sure, I, I can jump in. Um, I think when we look to the research, the numbers really vary. Um, but the research does show us that there is an extremely high rate of comorbidities in individuals on the autism spectrum. Um, so for depression, we see depression numbers is kind of three to four times more likely in individuals in the spectrum. Anxiety disorders, the numbers range from like 20 to 80% higher. Um, I think the issue that we have in terms of the research is that there are not necessarily specific tools uh, for clinicians and researchers to use to kind of capture anxiety and depression in individuals on the spectrum. So I think that's kind of a, a big obstacle that we face. Um, but, but I definitely think the comorbidity is extremely high um, when we're looking at individuals on the spectrum. Thank you. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to pick up where Michelle um, was just saying around the idea that um, I, th I think there are challenges inherent to autism spectrum disorders that put them at greater risk. Um, I, I, I think children with autism or, you know, I, I tend to work with children, so I might say students and children, but it's really anyone um, at any age level can, you know, often be constantly anxious about the world around them. And so um, researchers have known, I think, for some time that individuals with autism spectrum disorders and their family members tend to show increased rates of psychiatric conditions like anxiety, depression, ADHD. Um, and I, I believe the numbers are sort of like one third of children with diagnosed with AD, um, ASD also have sort of one of those other conditions, these comorbid conditions. But, um, but the, the two other things I just love to put out there is one is, you know, whenever we talk about it, and I'm sure people have heard this expression, but right, when you meet someone with autism, you've really met one person with autism, everybody sort of is very unique and different. Um, and, and I often like to put the framework out there that, you know, people with autism are not from a different planet, they just sort of speak a different language. So anything that neurotypicals might experience, I think we're going to talk about um, people with autism being at risk for as well. Okay, Katie, did you have something to add or? No, okay. So um, can some of you tell us what anxiety or depression might look like in a person with an autism spectrum disorder? Because as um, Peter, you just said, they all look very different. And so you might have one person with autism who is very verbal and another person who struggles with communication and some that are, you know, adults and toddlers and children. So help us try to understand what anxiety or depression might look like, how it might present, what things yeah. should we be on the lookout for? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. And I was, you know, thinking about the best way to answer the question. And and it is a bit of a challenge. I mean, um, the the two things I, I might share, one, one, the framework that I sometimes use is around hyperarousal and hypoarousal, you know, this idea that um, either side of that state of arousal is something to be on the lookout for. So, you know, a, a person who is acting out loudly, screaming, maybe, 
aggressive hitting others can actually be suffering from the same condition of anxiety or depression that the person who's hiding under their bed or constantly tired or avoidant of others is. And so um, I, I wouldn't want to limit those, but maybe just help with that understanding of those sort of like extreme ends of, of behavior. Um, the, the other part of that is just the idea that um, it can be a little bit more difficult to really narrow down what it looks like in someone with um, ASD, simply because their behaviors tend to be a bit unique or out of the norm as well. And so um, what I sometimes share with families is, you know, living with an individual or knowing an individual, right? Figure out what the baseline normally is, what are the behaviors you usually look like, and then look for differences in those behaviors. That's a really great way to, to describe it. I was thinking sort of along the same lines, you know, um, because I'm also a behavior analyst, a lot of the referrals for severe behavior get routed to me in the clinic. Um, and a really significant portion of those referrals, I would say, you know, when it's really severe meltdowns or aggression or even self-injury in my conceptualization or the ways that I think about those patients, oftentimes I see anxiety at the root of it. And, you know, whether that patient is able to tell me in words or not, it's usually some significant worry or situation that's going on in, in their lives that causes them such disruption and distress. And so I try to help families Sort of think about those behavioral um, episodes is rooted in anxiety many times. I think the other thing that's so challenging maybe in the way we think about anxiety and depression kind of in, in general society is that so many of individuals on the spectrum aren't going to be able to use the feeling words that we look for. <laughs> and so I think that makes it really tricky when we're trying to tease these things apart. And so rarely going to say I'm feeling really worried or I'm feeling really sad today. Um, you know, obviously a lot of us use picture faces and things that can serve as anchors um, to help with that. But in my experience, it's oftentimes the behavioral kind of, I love the way you said it, either like the behavioral excess of over overly reactive or talking about being tired all the time, kind of not wanting to eat, even the limited diet they would usually eat or wanting to stay in bed are a lot of the descriptions that I might get from parents that lead me to worry about depression in, in a child on the spectrum. So more of the kind of obvious things we could observe about um, changes in their, in their daily routine. Yeah, and I was gonna just say, since I work a lot with adults on the spectrum, that sometimes you can see kind of like a loss of Kind of skills. So people that were bathing independently, kind of regressing in kind of those areas of self-care. Um, we also sometimes see, and again, this isn't always indicative of kind of depression, but kind of a change in restricted interest. Um, so kind of taking on more morbid topics or preoccupation with death or dying. Um, but I mean, we do see that in individuals on the spectrum that don't aren't depressed as well. Um, but I think as um, Peter and Catherine pointed out, we're really looking for changes in behavior. That's helpful. So along those lines of, you know, starting to see themes um, of darkness or death, it makes me wonder about suicidality. Do people with autism um, have suicidal thoughts? Um, and what, how would you recognize those? And what would you do um, if you had a loved one who was expressing those kinds of, of feelings? Um, you know, maybe I'll take a quick stab or oh, that's a terrible phrase, sorry. Um, I, I was gonna say, uh, I'll start, but um, in my experience, I mean, they do, they certainly talk about suicide, but it's complicated, um, you know, I think sometimes it's been perceived as like a taboo subject that, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, both clinicians, families, that it's, it's a difficult topic to talk about. Um, but I do think that a lot of research is starting to come out um, around suicide and autism, in particular in like the last few years. And, and some of that I think is related to when individuals on the spectrum end up in a hospital setting or in a, in a um, you know, a more, um, severe um, sort of school setting, and then they're sort of looking at 
um, those target behaviors. Um, but the rates, I believe, are higher. I mean, I, I just think that sometimes when you have the diagnosis of autism, you are, you know, again, at risk for just many, many of these things, which is why this topic, I think, is just so critically important. Um, to your question about what could um, people listening, you know, do, one of the things that we're, we're, training a lot on in school systems is using like the Columbia suicide severity rating scale. And this is sort of like a, um, a question, you know, uh, answer guide that that's online and available to, to most people, but it's something to consider. I mean, it's, it's the things that I think are important about it without going too deep into that particular scale is the idea that talking about suicide is not going to um, make it happen or place ideas in someone's head. They're either there or or they're not. And so it's just really important, I think, for families to check in with, um, you know, their, their children or their loved ones. Uh, ideation, thinking about suicide, right, is one form of problem solving. When we are frustrated and overwhelmed and, and we feel like we're at our um, wits end, thinking if life was over is something that pops into people's heads. I think what's important is to, to, teach and to work with individuals to help them understand that there are much better choices than taking your life. And um, some of the important things to share is that when you are having this conversation, it, it's important to get a few, to get a sense of the details that, that people are thinking about. So I often use um, an acronym around like how specific, accessible, or lethal of a plan. So if, if someone tells me that, you know, they are, you know, nine years old, 12 years old, and they're going to get in a car and drive to the bridge and try to jump off the bridge, that doesn't seem too possible for a 12 year old who doesn't have access to the keys or the pedal or the, you know, or the bridge or things like that. But if they say things like, I'm going to go to the kitchen at night when my parents are sleeping, and take something sharp out of the drawers, that begins to really concern me and elevate me to the point where you want to seek help for those things. As well as if you start to talk about this topic of suicide and someone tells you that they've actually taken steps, like I've looked in the medicine cabinet and to see what kind of medicine is in there that I could potentially take. Those are all really clear warning signs that I think people would, would want to um, you know, not rest on, but act on and just reach out to a psychologist or to a loved one and, and to help. Great, that's really helpful. Katie, did you wanna add? Oh, I was, I was gonna say Peter covered a lot of the parts that I think about. The only kind of thing I was also thinking about is, um, you know, I, obviously it can be so jarring for any parent to hear just even anything like, I wish I was dead from a, a child especially. And I think, um, you know, one of the things oftentimes that might be a reason for referral into clinic as well of just kind of they said something at school and the school said we need to come get help. Um, and so that is a really hard job for parents to try to decide is this something that means I need to go in immediately or should I wait and I think, you know, I, I kind of have those same conversations about a lot of times it can be a situational factor that's really overwhelming. And it's just this passive thought of like, it'd be easier if, if I didn't have to deal with math anymore. And I think once you kind of have concrete conversations with kids about what they said actually means, many times they're like, oh, I didn't want that. I just didn't want to go back to math. Um, and then you are able to get such good information if they say, yeah, I know what it means. I, I do feel that way sometimes. And, and it's really... I appreciate what you said, Peter. I think it's it, it's so scary for us to imagine a child or an adolescent or adult, you know, harming themselves that it becomes something the family wants to avoid discussing. And then what I find is just having a really open conversation usually is able to help the parent feel so much more comfortable and help us understand if it's something we really need to follow up on closely or just kind of check in about periodically because maybe they had um, a lot of stress and weren't able to tell us in other ways. Perfect, thank you. Um, so let's turn and start thinking about, well, what do we do about um, anxiety and depression in people with autism? So what are the recommended um, treatments for mood problems in ASD? And does that change based on age and, and language level? Um, so I can just start. So I typically work with, I would say like, 
school age children and above um, who are fairly verbal. Um, and I use cognitive behavioral therapy. So that is kind of an evidence-based treatment for individuals on the spectrum who have anxiety and depression. Um, and it's basically the idea that how we think about situations impacts how we feel, impacts how we behave. Um, and we all know that we can't just change our feelings, um, but if we can change maybe how we think about things, that can impact how we feel and how we behave. Um, and CBT is evidence-based for neurotypical individuals, and it looks similar uh, when you're working with individuals in the spectrum, but there are some modifications. So we typically use more concrete language. Um, we break things down simpler. And then I think a big piece when working with individuals in the spectrum is to also support the skills that they're struggling with. Um, so I work with a lot of teens and adults who are feeling depressed because they don't have friends or they're being bullied. Um, and I think it's really important that we're addressing the anxiety and the stress and the depression, but we're also developing social skills and supporting them or helping them with executive functioning if they're failing out of college and getting stressed. Um, so when I'm working with individuals on the spectrum and kind of what research supports is kind of like a two pronged approach where you're kind of treating the symptom and the anxiety and depression, but you're also building skills. Great. Um, Katie, would you like to tell us a little bit about what your treatments look like for kids with autism or sure. problems? So, um, yeah, so I, one of the, one of my most favorite things about my job is getting to do a lot of family therapy. So one of the other tricky things about anxiety and depression is they often run in families. So we will see um, very, very often um, the child in front of me has, you know, this comorbid anxiety and depression with an autism spectrum disorder, but maybe one of their parents or both of their parents sometimes has anxiety or depression, whether they've been diagnosed with that or, or gotten treatment for that is often just up in the air. But um, we do tend to see that a lot of the the challenges that the child is going through in terms of anxious thought or um, kind of depressive symptoms is something that maybe someone in their family has also gone through. And so I think it's a really wonderful opportunity when you can bring family members in to help kind of show how some of those patterns could be developing in the way the parent copes um, with things in life or maybe needs some extra support that you're able to then get them connected to and and so then we can kind of help the parent-child relationship, which I think oftentimes in, in my work, it's really hard for me to just treat the child individually because then if they're going back to a, a family where maybe someone else is struggling, it, it tends to not be as supportive for their new strategies. Um, and so I really like to bring family members in and just see if that's a concern for them as well and how I can help either get them connected to services or do family-based strategies to help everybody kind of feel more supported and more aware of different tools to use. Um, th those were two very comprehensive answers. So I'm, I'm trying to think of what I could add to the conversation. Um, and, and maybe what I'll do is I'll try to break it up into, you know, students that I think of who have language um, and, and what we do for that versus, you know, maybe students that are um, more profound or nonverbal. And so for the students that maybe are more profound, I do think that we have to work really hard on the communication skills. I know that was said maybe by both Catherine and Michelle, but um, some of those feeling words, being able to identify the, the emotional state they're in it is very challenging. And so I think we have to really work hard on um, identifying them, giving them vocabulary to do that. In many examples, it's giving them visuals. We can use the iPad, we can use, um, storyboards and other kinds of things. And, and I know sometimes the way we're building into that is really modeling uh, the emotions and uh, states as well as the problem solving. So it's a lot of like, 
uh, you know, it's early in the morning, I'm feeling tired and grumpy and here's what I'm going to do. Or, you know, I just got some bad news and this is the way I would typically feel or someone did something to me and this is maybe how I would be feeling and what I would do with it. And I think through those, you know, visuals and, and, I, and um, giving them communication skills as well as sort of modeling the problem solving, almost like in a social story kind of setting, uh, I think we get some some pretty good results as far as managing or treating the the anxiety and or the depression. Um, in students that are a bit more verbal or or you know higher functioning, I think we're spending a lot of time looking for the triggers, really trying to identify what it is in their world seems to be upsetting them or setting them off. Um, students with ASD really can be very sensitive to so many things or just perceive the world in such a way that if you can gain access access to what those triggers are. Um, it feels like half the battle sometimes. And then I, I'd say that as a result of the pandemic, um, I have seen a tremendous rise on avoidant behavior. And so specifically around like anxiety, right? When you get into that anxious state, your first response is, I just want to stop it. I want to just run away from it and avoid it. And what we know in psychology is that, and behavior analysis is that if you avoid it, it actually reinforces that anxiety. And so what you've got to do is sort of like build back almost like a sy systematic desensitization to putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions and then saying, okay, I did it. I, I think maybe that's more for anxiety, but sometimes the depression anxiety overlap is, is pretty strong. Great. So since you mentioned COVID, tell me um, in your practices, what have you seen um, different this year as a result of COVID? How has COVID impacted people with autism spectrum disorders? Um, and maybe also how um, it's changed how you're delivering treatment. I, I mean, I could start with one funny story. There was, there was a, a young adult with autism who said to me, when the pandemic hit, I was hearing the news say that in order to save other people's lives, I had to stay home, not interact with anybody, and just like watch Netflix and play video games. And he said, I was built for this. I could totally do this to save the planet, right? And and he made me laugh, right? The idea that s some of that social anxiety and that communication, he was now able to sort of like avoid these situations, whether it be work or, you know, friends or things like that. Um, but unfortunately, I think for most, it, it, it's been really hard. It's, it's been hard on everybody, but unfortunately, many of the treatment approaches and interventions and the things we're really pushing students with autism to develop um, don't translate as well on the computer or through Zoom. And so I, I think there's been a whole added layer to that. And then whenever you talk about students with disabilities, more profound disabilities, you know, the speech and OT, the ABA services, those are so much richer when it's in person in a school or in a setting. And uh, we've had to adapt a lot of those. So I, I know professionals have done an outstanding job with pivoting, but it, it just has not been great. Yeah. I think, um, you know, in terms of how it's impacted maybe anxiety and depression, our whole society, I feel like, has had worsened anxiety, especially, and, and certainly I've, I've seen that in all of my patients on the spectrum, whether they're able to label it as such or not. And so definitely much more specific, almost phobias developing around germ exposure or social experience of, you know, now that at least here in Texas, people are getting out there as if life's back to normal in some ways. And so I think it's hard because now a lot of parents are saying, well, they don't want to even go to the grocery store with me. They don't even want to go to the park anymore. And, and I really have to normalize a lot of that of, you know, this is such a huge adjustment back to going out and, you know, we're going to need to structure some short experiences that feel really successful for them and give them ways to feel safe and, and rules for how to engage that feel really comfortable. But I think, um, definitely more kind of specific things that are just almost um, exaggerated versions of what all of us are going through worries about family members dying and not being able to say that so then maybe being really disruptive towards that family member they're just kind of things 
themes that were were kind of taken to an extreme degree because of the sort of rigidity in their thinking. Yeah, and I would kind of echo um, what both panelists said that I think we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of referrals. Um, every day we're getting calls um, from parents, individuals on the spectrum. I will say in my clinical practice, I've kind of seen a divide and I've seen some teens and adults thrive right now um, and really make use of virtual supports um, and are feeling less anxious. Now the anxiety is returning because in New York, things are starting to reopen. Um, and there's an expectation for a lot of students that they are going to be returning to school. So in some ways I'm seeing an increase in anxiety now because there is that return um, to social skills. But then I do definitely have a large portion of clients that are struggling more. Um, their services have been disrupted. Their routines have been changed. I would say, one of the main things that I've seen during the pandemic is the parental stress. Um, so caregivers are just um, feeling a significant burden, um, having kids at home, kids with autism at home all day, having to provide the programming um, is putting a significant strain, I would say, on caregivers, in my opinion. But I also want to point out, I was talking to a colleague yesterday who um, is at a school, and she actually pointed out that she's actually seeing kids become much more independent than she would have ever thought they could be. So being able to kind of go on to a Zoom and kind of learning some life skills that probably wouldn't have been taught to kids um, at age five, um, but were required to be taught. Um, so I know she was saying as an educator, she's going to have to readjust her expectations when everyone goes back to school um, because we have seen some kind of successes during the pandemic. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. So um, how do you think autism acceptance or inclusion might play a role in abating anxiety and depression for people with autism? I think one of the most exciting things I've seen, and I'm sure Peter can speak to this even better, is the um, sort of inclusive education happening in school settings at really young ages. So I've had, multiple patients over the years have opportunities to present to their classmates about what they wanted to teach about autism. And it became such a positive um, opportunity where they didn't feel singled out, but instead got to make cool picture slideshows of, of things about them and what they were passionate about. And um, it's just been such an incredibly important shift to see certainly than what I can think about when I was in school. And I think, as all of us want to feel like we belong and we're accepted, it goes such a way to help kids on the spectrum not feel alienated. It changes a school culture, so bullying is so much less likely. And if it does happen, other people are willing to stand up and say, you know, don't do that. So I think um, it has really a huge impact on both anxiety and depression for kids to not feel like they're going to be um, picked on or made fun of if they're struggling with something socially or have a speech disability or you know anything like that so definitely important yeah uh K catherine said that well that um you know we I, I feel like schools are doing more than they ever have which is which is a great starting point i mean um you know, to answer your question, right? I mean, th those basic psychological feelings of like safety, love, belonging, if you if you create that in a school setting or in a work setting or wherever an individual is, then it is it is absolutely going to lessen the impact of of you know anxiety or depression. Um, but it takes some intentional work, I think, to get there for you know systems. And so, many many years ago, I I had a young man at the middle school level who came to my office and said, I don't know how to talk to my friends about my younger brother who was just diagnosed with autism. They want to come to my house, but his behaviors look very different. And I just don't know what to say to them. And I think that was the impetus for conversations around awareness building. And so, so I think raising awareness is, is one of those really important starts, you know, and then 
better understanding about the behaviors and and why you know children do the things they do ultimately leads i think to to that more inclusionary sort of feeling like if we have people with autism working and and in our classrooms and around us and we better understand that we're going to have more positive experiences with them and that's going to lead i think to to real inclusivity so um and again kudos to the bedford playhouse right for raising awareness and having this conversation um even tonight so and again just to put like the young adult adult perspective on things i think even moving forward from the school setting, thinking about like college programs. Um, so there are more and more college programs springing up that are giving individuals on the spectrum supports socially and with executive functioning so that high schoolers on the spectrum have the opportunity to go to college with their peers. Um, inclusive hiring practices. So I think when we think about causes of depression for all of us, thinking about unemployment, not having a peer group, um, so as much as the, I think the neurodiversity movement really kind of helps those pieces um, because it creates work environments and college environments where everybody's accepted and everyone is seen as unique and kind of having this unique perspective. Um, so I think that definitely will be helpful in decreasing like the anxiety and depression. Great. Um, so some questions are starting to come in from um, the audience. So I'm going to try to summarize those and, and get your reactions. So um, one parent is asking, what can they do to help motivate their teen who's on the spectrum to really commit to making behavioral changes? So he might be, he's going to therapy and he's fine with going to therapy, but when it comes to actually making those behavior changes, um, he's still, they're really struggling to figure out how to help him get him really engaged and motivated. So what do you do when motivation's an issue around therapy? Um, I, I'll, I'm happy to share my perspective. I think um, one of the first conversations I have with families of teens is that the teen has to want to come to therapy and has to want to work on the things that we're setting as goals. And so if a parent's really driving the ship in terms of, well, I think they should do this or I think they should do that. That's kind of one of our first family sessions of just talking through um, therapy has to feel voluntary. Therapy has to feel um, comfortable for everybody. And so not always comfortable, but at least <laughs> the idea of going. Um, and so I think I try to use a lot of um, sort of techniques to help get the, the child or adolescent to help me understand what their motivation might be to change. So it's a really tough thing. I, I have a lot of older teens on the spectrum who, whether it's because they've had such bad experiences in the past, or maybe it truly is their um, experience internally, they're convinced they don't need to have friends. And their parents are bringing them to treatment saying, we need you to get friends. They need a social life. They're so lonely. And, you know, I might spend multiple sessions really talking about these are some of the reasons people have relationships. What do you think about that? And there's a subset of my patients who just really stick to that. Like, you know, I'm really happy being on my own. I don't feel depressed. I don't feel lonely. I have what I need in my gaming online relationships. And I have challenged parents to be open to accepting that for those those patients and certainly we're going to monitor them and make sure they don't start to experience any depression but I think it's kind of broadening our ideas of what um what life can look like sometimes and accepting that maybe if it's not the right time for them right now it might be in the future maybe once they start wanting to have a romantic relationship or um if that's something they're even interested in but you know, I think um, it's a really hard thing with teens in general. And then when you add on kind of some of the core symptoms of autism, it just makes it even more difficult. So motivation is a, is a big piece for sure. Michelle, um, an, another um, person kind of chimed in and asked, well, what about when they're an adult, when they're legally an adult and you are, as a parent, are concerned that they're, you know, um, struggling with things or, or like Katie said, not having um, friends or, or, or 
not doing well, but they themselves are resistant to going to therapy. Um, what do you do then? Yeah, so I think similar um, to what was said about teens, adults need to want to go. Um, and similarly, we see some adults that are okay going to work, coming home to their apartment, not really having a like rich social life, but they are happy and they watch anime and maybe once a year they go to Comic-Con. Um, and some of it's talking to parents that like not everybody's life plan looks the same. And obviously we wanna monitor and if there's depression or um, self-interest behavior or symptoms of anxiety, that would be cause um, for concern. But sometimes it is educating parents as to the idea that their expectations for what their adult child's life was going to look like might not be in line with what their adult child wants. Um, and that's kind of a common theme that I see when working with young adults. Um, and sometimes it's about finding the right match of therapist. Um, so I, when people call me and I say, you know, I could be the perfect therapist for one person and the worst therapist for another. Um, and I, I think sometimes it's about just finding that right match, the, the person that the adult or teen connects with on whatever level um, and kind of just going from there and focusing on what the adult, what is motivating the adult. Is it that they want um, to be able to travel independently, okay? So that's what you want here's what like your family's saying is getting in the way. So can we work on that stuff so we can get you traveling independently? Um, so helping adults kind of reframe because I think sometimes when I work with adults on the spectrum, parents still wanna be very involved, but adults want to be more independent. Um, so negotiating that relationship and kind of helping adults feel like they have a voice, but still acknowledging that they do need a lot of supports from their families and sometimes their family are seeing things that the adult might not be aware of. And, uh, you know, I'm going to add to, to both of those. I, um, I, I agree with so much of what was said, right? I mean, in particular with the young adults, right? Or the adults, um, college age, 20 years old or whatever. Um, I think there is a very important con concept about what are the personal goals, what are the parent goals, right? And and sometimes just listing those out, you can really start to see. I think I think the nuances um, for adults, um, you know, finding a hook finding a way to get them to understand that maybe they are happy and that things are okay in their mind, but that they could maximize certain things, um, I, th I think is an important concept. And tied to that, you know, one of the things that I, I sometimes worry about just seeing it from a developmental perspective is that, you know, there are behaviors that sometimes just get reinforced in really young kids, right? Like they love to run up and just hug a stranger. And then when they get to the middle school, they run up and hug a stranger and it's no longer socially appropriate. And then when they're an adult, they run up and hug a stranger and they get arrested for it and they end up, you know, being involved in law enforcement or the courts. And so I, I do think for some parents, right, they are worried about that trajectory. And they're thinking, if we don't work on some of these things, what is it going to look like at the next stage, which maybe individuals on the spectrum aren't thinking about, right, as far as what's, what's coming next. So um, I think to reiterate, right, I mean, that idea of just sort of helping understand what are those personal goals versus the, the professional goals. And I think it can't be understated that that notion about working with the right therapist, right? I mean, I do think that, that there's not enough therapists that really have expertise in autism, but that you, you kind of have to find one or match up with one. I mean, um, I mentioned earlier, like I, I work as you know, a uh, volunteer for the, for the Westchester County Psychological Association. I talk to lots of therapists, right? And they're really great at talk therapy. Um, that 
I don't think works for, for kids with autism. Kids with autism would love to just sit and talk about their interests for hours and hours, but that isn't going to get them any closer, I think, to learning skills or addressing some of those issues. And so sometimes it's more like psychoeducation. It's, it's okay, you're coming in. Here's what we're going to talk about. Here's the agenda. Here might even be rules that you've got to like, you know, fit into. And sometimes it could feel not like therapy, but, but more like, you know, really, um, uh, maybe a mini classroom or a mini lecture or something. But then really the important thing is I can't work in isolation, you know, in my office. I've got to teach parents what it is we were doing so that they can then almost be the coach when they're outside of the the um, the office and stuff like that. And I, I, I think that might answer a little bit of, you know, both questions that were asked that, um, yeah, those are some thoughts to do. Yeah, and, and another audience member um, asked, how do you help and deal with kids at the same time that you help parents with like the subtle nuanced navigation of the high school aged years? I think all of us can remember how difficult that was for us. And then you add on the layer of having an autism spectrum disorder, um, this parent saying it's, it's a difficult time. So how do you help um, teens and their families navigate um, those adolescent years and, and all of the new things that come up um, with puberty and, and just the changes in, in um, the social environment as they get older. I think uh, one of the ways I think about um, when I get to do family therapy is, is that we're practicing how to have those conversations together. And I'm kind of modeling for the parent how to be open and neutral <laughs> in the way that I respond, because I think all of us want the best for our kids. And sometimes the reactions that we think are showing how much we love them are actually feeling like judgment or criticism. And so I, I, I find it really helpful to practice those conversations together where I can kind of be like a mediator for parents and their children, especially at this age group because the truth is there's not really right answers to most of the questions. There's not one correct way to do. I just um, have a, an appointment tomorrow and the mom emailed me today to say, you know, my daughter got this high school class assignment and it's to watch this film that's a little bit over the level we would typically let her watch. So I'm gonna say she can't watch it, but I know she's gonna be so upset because her friends are gonna get to watch the film. and so that, that will be my morning tomorrow. But, you know, what I do with that family is we talk about letting the daughter express how that's going to feel for her, letting the mom express why it's important to her to, to kind of maybe make this hard decision, and then helping them both sort of teach, take each other's perspectives in a way that um, is more difficult for someone on the spectrum to do, and then helping parents learn how to validate feelings without fixing feelings, I think is another big thing that so much of high school will feel unfair and feel upsetting. And, and that is true for everyone. And especially when your emotions might feel more um, intense. And so helping parents um, pause before they jump into a problem solving or fixing mode and just saying, gosh, that's so hard. I'm sorry, you're feeling really upset about this. And as simple as that sounds and in the majority of families where I work, that's not happening naturally because there's just so much stress on everybody. And the child is, is going through such difficult scenarios that the parents have just gotten into that mode of always fixing. Um, and so it's been really an amazing thing. I consider it a sacred privilege of mine to get to join families in those conversations because it is so intimate and it is so important to be able to be the kind of this ability to, to try a different way of communicating with each other. That's great, thank you. So um, um, one person is, is, is kind of reaffirming this um, idea that you guys said that um, it can be really hard to find a therapist um, who has expertise and works with people with autism spectrum disorders. Um, and that's sometimes they've had the experience where they're looking for a therapist and they call and when they say their child has autism, that's an automatic, you know, shutdown. We don't, we don't do that. We don't serve that. So 
one, um, someone kind of wanted to know, how did you guys decide to specialize in autism? Why did you go into this area of expertise? And what do we think, what do you think um, needs to happen in order to increase access to um, needed therapy services for people with autism? Um, I mean, for me, I got, I got hooked. I, I, I think, I mean, I, I tell this story sometimes, right? I mean, my very first day as a school psychologist in a middle school, there was a sixth grade girl that ran out of the classroom and to the front of the school building and climbed up a tree. And, and that, I mean, this is 25 or 26 years ago and no one was using the term autism, they, they threw around a lot of other terms. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanted to know more. I, I was fascinated by the way she saw the world and, and the way her brain worked and the, what her behaviors were trying to tell us. Um, so for me, I mean, it just became almost instantaneous. But um, I think the, the part of that question is, uh, almost like what we were saying about school age children and awareness building, like we have to let, you know, therapists and medical professionals know that this is not something, you know, so foreign from another planet that they can't treat it or that they can't learn some skills that will really benefit them, the families that are, that are in need in the communities um, and the individuals. So um, I think a lot more training, more awareness raising, more training, you know, just that that would be my answer. Yeah, and I feel like similarly, I entered this field 20 years ago, working at YAI, kind of on a very broad range of all developmental disabilities. Um, and I kind of just clicked with kind of working with the kids and adults on the spectrum. Um, and then I did a training at the Seaver Center. Um, I did a fellowship at YAI and kind of always stayed in this area and kind of attend conferences and learn from other professionals. Um, and something that the Seaver Center has been doing um, and will continue to do is kind of, as um, Peter was saying, giving general clinicians tools that to use and build their confidence um, to kind of increase the number of therapists uh, that will work with kids and adults and teens on the spectrum. Um, so we've done that at kind of within the Mount Sinai outpatient system. And then my kind of the grant that I have, I work at community mental health centers, so like WJCS. Um, so working with their staff and kind of helping them kind of learn evidence-based practices. So I think we're trying, um, but there's still kind of a lot to um, be done. For me, um, I completely lucked on a practicum placement as an undergraduate student in Louisiana, um, where my match was to an autism um, clinic. And I knew nothing about autism before I was sent there and really haven't looked back since. So that I am so thankful that that happened because um, it really, similar to you, Michelle, it clicked for me that day and, and it brings me so much joy. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I noticed we have interns and postdocs who come through our clinic. And for many of them, our clinic is the first place they're experiencing autism, even though they're at a more advanced level of training as psychologists and future psychologists. And so they're very honest with me at the start that they're afraid of <laughs> the patients, that they, they have not ever had experiences with anyone on the spectrum and they're intimidated by um, some of the challenges. And so I think it's been really rewarding to get to see kind of how we're able to directly impact those groups of people, as well as, you know, even though Dallas is such a big place, there's very few people in the community who are comfortable taking our referrals. And so we um, similarly do a lot of training and outreach to try to teach um, community providers um, skills that they might be able to use to um, be able to serve people in their own communities instead of needing to send them to the center, as well as um, offering to do consultations so that if there is an autism specific question, we can help with it. But for some of the kind of more standard stuff, they're totally able to run with those things. So it is, it's a hard balance for sure. And I uh, read the quote, you said you, you get doors slammed in your face when you mention your child has autism. And that is such a common thing that I hear. And I'm, I'm really hoping we can change that. Thank you. And yes, someone just commented, 
please spread the word in your professional communities that working with people with autism can be very rewarding, um, um, which I, I definitely agree with as well. Um, so uh, someone asked if you could make some sort of change to the medical model of autism at present, what would it be? Maybe kind of our understanding I'm not sure if they're asking about like our understanding of autism or if they're talking about like how we treat autism, how we diagnose autism. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure the nuance of the question, I, I, uh, but two thoughts came to mind. I mean, one is, um, you know, we use the DSM, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, right? I mean, we, we collect observations about behaviors. And, and I think for, for a very long time, we, we didn't get it right. We, we were not looking for, you know, things like anxiety and autism or depression and autism. We were just assuming if you have an autism diagnosis, it covers all this unusual behavior and we're not going to treat the anxiety or the depression. So I think we're moving out of that model, which is really great. Um, or, and, and some of it is coming from the better science, the better research that, you know, I'm sure Michelle could, could cite even better than I. Um, the, the other part is, unfortunately, sometimes our medical system is really built on looking at people's weaknesses and their symptoms. And those, I find, are not often leading us to solutions, interventions, and better outcomes. I think we really do have to make this huge shift to uh, people's strengths, to, to the things that they you know, offer that are unique that we had not thought about. Sometimes we're trying to fit it into the you know, society's mold or the school's mold. But if we can change the environment, the setting of the school, we can change workplace environments, you know, it's going to benefit, that diversity is going to benefit all of us. So. And I sit on so many boards with like self-advocates and as a psychologist and coming from that medical model, and I'm talking about the DSM, it, I know it does not align with self-advocates. It does not align with neurodiversity movement. And I have a lot of conflict, but I also know that the diagnosis is the key to services um, and that we know services are beneficial. Um, so kind of agreeing, I, it's a, a systemic issue. Um, I hope that the team that you're, if you have a child or adult are working with, doesn't just use that label to define the child and kind of uses the label to get services and supports in the school or accommodations uh, in the workplace, um, but really is looking at that individual and their own strengths and weaknesses. Great. Um, um, one uh, audience member also pointed out the fact that so few medications have been tested um, to see how effective they are for people with autism. Um, and that may also be contributing to, um, you know, a lack of, of known effective treatments for people with autism. Do any of you guys wanna to speak to, to the problem of, of people with autism because of their diagnosis being excluded from, um, from research and, and drug trials? Yeah, I mean, so I'll also talk about, I was, um, I talk a lot about this with one of my colleagues who is a psychiatrist. I mean, autism spectrum disorders are different than like ADHD. Um, so ADHD, there's a very specific mechanism and we know medication works. Autism spectrum disorders is a much more heterogeneous diagnosis. So the cause of autism is different from one person to the next. The presentation is different from one person to the next. So I would actually think that the heterogeneity of autism is kind of what impacts, unfortunately, the results in a lot of clinical trials. Um, so I know a lot of the psychiatrists that I work with do prescribe medication in individuals in the spectrum for anxiety and depression um, with success. Um, but I think it's important that if medication is the right thing for your family, that you're seeing a psychiatrist um, who is familiar with individuals in the spectrum, just because there can be different side effects, the doses can be, um, might be adjusted. Um, and there are some medications that work better and some medications that can actually increase anxiety. Um, but I definitely, for most of the clients I see, there is definitely a role of medication with therapy. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a great point that 
there's not necessarily a medication for autism. Um, there may be medications that have been shown to be effective for certain symptoms, um, but there's not a medication for autism per se. And in part because of, of the nature of the disorder having so many multiple um, potential causes and risk factors. All right, well, it is one minute left. Um, I just wanna take a, a minute to um, thank all of you for joining us tonight. I hope this was um, informative for the audience. It was enjoyable for me. Um, I always love to hear from, from my fellow colleagues who have expertise in autism. Um, and I think these types of events are very important for the reasons we talked about of um, better um, acceptance, awareness, inclusion, um, both for the community, but also um, for us as professionals, as we try to expand um, um, the access to services for people with autism. So thank you all. <laughs> and thank you, Cassandra. It was a great job. We really appreciate it. And then everybody's time, thank you again. Um, and as uh, we should mention that we did record tonight. So everybody who is tuned in will get a copy of the link to the recording. So if there's a part you want to revisit or forward to someone you think may find it useful, um, please do so. That'll be coming your way in the next, uh, next day or so. So thank you very much again, everybody. What a pleasure. Thank you all. Have a great night. Good night. <laughs>